Daniel chapter 12. I'll read to you verses 4 through 7. Maybe I'll read verse 8 as we'll refer to verse 8, but verses 4 through 7 is really where our concentration will be today. <clears throat> In verse 4 of Daniel 12, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the river, the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he had held up his right hand, and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half, when he shall uh, accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall the end of these, thing, of these things? And I'll stop there because it just, that statement there about Daniel understanding, we're going to probably mention that, so I read that verse with it. This is actually the, the last vision of Daniel. You see him talking about the things that he saw, and so this is the last vision, and it's close to the last revelation as we, we end in verse 8 there. You realize Daniel's going to ask, uh, get a, ask one last question, and the Lord is going to answer that one last question. But where we begin in verse 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So the book of Daniel is a sealed book, uh, and by the statement, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase, that there'll be a, a that knowledge will increase to me when I read that concerning the things that are in this book. I know a lot of people, when they read that, they think, oh, that's modern day, time to and fro. They're jumping on airplanes, they're flying all over the place, people going to and fro, and certainly all kinds of technology is increasing, and even science, at least medical science and that type of thing is increasing. And so they, when they look at that, they say, oh, look, that was all predicted. And while that might be so, and it might be an application of that, uh, Daniel is actually, he's, he's thinking about the things that he's learned and seen in this book. And when you talk about sealing the book, and then there's going to be this period of time that, where people are going to run to and fro, it's, it's, he's actually preparing Daniel that the, the, that the book is going to be sealed for a long time, and that there's going to be progressive revelation, knowledge shall increase. And, uh, and so that's really the, 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 what Daniel, what's being communicated in verse 4. When he says, notice verse 4 begins with, but thou, O Daniel. And I remind you that chapter 12, verse 1, is Michael the archangel bringing the tribulation to an end. Verses 2 and 3 have to do with the judgment that's going to come at the second coming of Jesus Christ. We've covered all those things. And then he says, but thou, O Daniel. Now, now Daniel is going to get uh, some knowledge about the things that, that he's seen, the things that uh, have been accomplished, even Daniel's last question concerning what shall be the end of these things, it says, okay, you're gonna, the tribulation's gonna end, and, the, uh, 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 and there's gonna be a resurrection, and then, then what? What's the end of all this? And that's really how the book ends in da when Daniel gets that, uh, that part of the understanding. So that, that's where, where we are. When it talks about the book being sealed, um, and it's really until the time of the end, and we keep reading about the end, the end, the end. The, the book being sealed to the time of the end, and the very fact that there is this uh, knowledge shall increase, the Bible itself is a book of progressive revelation. Now you've probably learned that already, or just could see that, because when we studied verses 2 and 3 about the resurrection, we saw that the resurrection of the unjust doesn't take place at the coming of the, of the first at the coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. It takes place after he reigns a thousand years. The the resurrection of the unjust of the damned, but the the resurrection of the believer, the resurrection of the just, takes place upon his return. Now you wouldn't know that reading verses two and three, but there's progressive revelation, and when you think about revelation, 
the book itself, uh, that, that that book itself takes all kinds of prophecies that have been, have been made in the Bible and kind of lays them out on a timeline where the knowledge of these things, how, how, what they're going to, what's going to be done and how they're going to be fulfilled and when they're going to be fulfilled is, uh, is laid out. So the book of Revelation itself is part of that knowledge shall increase. They'll understand more things. Daniel, we, you know, when, we, when I went to Bible college, the class that I took was Daniel Revelation. They taught them together. The first time I taught, probably on the Sunday, the book of Revelation, I started with four messages on Daniel before we started in Revelation. Because Daniel sets Revelation up, but Revelation makes it, makes it all clearer. What's, what the events are, what this tribulation and the things are going to take place. So that, I think about that, Daniel didn't have the knowledge that we have. We have the revelation, we see the visions that Daniel had and the interpretations that were given to him, but we have more complete Bible where we can actually go to other places and add to what Daniel is seeing. Uh, you might recall that when we, well, you'll see in a minute, that what Daniel's vision is, he's actually seeing the Lord in the second coming. We knew that because we went to Revelation chapter 1. Daniel never had Revelation chapter 1. <laughs> His, to him, it's, uh, this is it, Daniel. No more, no more, no more revelation, no more visions, except that in verse 5, he gets this last final vision that he is now going to see. So we have that. Now, not only do we have the fact that Knowledge shall increase in the sense that we're going to have a complete revelation. That took place at the end of the first century after the, the apostles uh, got their revelation, after Paul received his revelation of the mystery. But there's also the Holy Spirit working today still is giving us illumination to those things. As we study, we, we begin to see things. That the more you study, the more you see. And so that's, we call that illumination. And that's part of that knowledge that's increasing even after the Bible is complete. Because now we got it to study, and the more we study it, the more we can see the truth of the Bible. And sometimes we have to see the errors that are taught in order to see the truth. But that knowledge increases. Um, so there's progressive revelation and understanding. In, uh, when, when we start in verse 5, it says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two other, uh, other two, I always read it backwards, other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. I think in five, six, and seven, he keeps saying the river, the river, the river. <laughs> what are we talking about? Well, remember, the, the final vision of Daniel started in chapter 10. This is, this is just an increase in what Daniel is seeing but it's not really a new vision. Uh, if you go back to chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> it says in verse 1, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, there was a, a thing revealed unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, and the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing, and ha uh, he understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. Now Daniel is later going to say that he don't have understanding, and he's looking for understanding. Well, there's one thing to say he understood the vision. I understand the vision. I've read it. <laughs> to understand all that the vision is about, and especially when it says it's a long time. Uh, Daniel's seeing things that, that are going to be fulfilled in a long distance of time, and certainly the second coming of Christ. You know what I mean? It's 2,000 years since Christ's coming till he comes back again. He's another 600 years before that when Daniel's receiving this revelation. So the things he is hearing about, learning about, is a long way off. And he understands the thing. He understands the vision and maybe a little bit about what it's about, but he don't fully understand it. And uh, So anyhow, but the vision itself, verse 4. It, and in the four and twentieth day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river, which is called Hittical. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man, clothed in, in linen, whose loins were girded with fine, uh, the, with fine gold of upaz, and his body was like, the, like burly, uh, and, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as a, flame, as a lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet 
in the color of polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now, notice in verse 5 that he sees in that river, he says, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen. And then he gives more of a description. That's the, that man that he's seeing, he's seeing Jesus Christ coming in a second coming. And we know that, you'd have to go back and watch when we started chapter 10, but we compared that to Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 1, what John saw in the vision of Revelation. And it's the same description. So what Daniel's seeing is the Lord Jesus Christ coming. But if you now compare that back to chapter 12, when we pick up in verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. So now he's seeing more. There's not just the man in the river there, the Lord Jesus Christ, but he sees two others, one on each side of the river. So they're on the side of the river. Then look at verse 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters. So the man clothed in linen is upon the waters. These two angels are ones on this side of the river, ones on that side of the river, but the man clothed in linen is in the center of the river. And that man clothed in linen is the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're asking him the question, how long shall it be, uh, shall it be to the end of these wonders? So they're asking him for a timeline. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, that's singular, times, that's plural, and a half. And we keep reading that. I don't know, I don't think you need me to run through all the places where that's mentioned. We've seen it in Daniel, we've seen it in Revelation. Time singular is one year. Times plural, that's at least two. So there's one year, and then two years, and then a half, three and a half years. And we, we verified that ever since, uh, since Daniel chapter 9 about the tribulation being two periods of three and a half years, seven years total. You have it over and over again in the book of Revelation, whether it's called 42 months or 1,260 days or three and a half years or time, times, and half a time. It just keeps repeating that. So here we have it again. The how long shall this be? It's going to be three and a half years when they shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. Now that's the king of the north that we've been reading about all through chapter 11, how he's going to come in and he's going to scatter the nation of Israel. Do you remember when he does that? Daniel, uh, we won't go there again, but we've been several times to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, flee into the wilderness. And that's where you read in Daniel, Revelation chapter 11 that the Antichrist is going to overrun Jerusalem for 42 months, three and a half years. So he's going to come in, and the last three and a half years, he's taken over the land of Israel. And so the question, how long shall these things be? He says, uh, it says, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So he's going to come in, in three and a half years, it's going to be over. And it's going to be over by the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we started in chapter 1, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, Michael the archangel standing up and, and finishing things off uh, as uh, protecting the nation of Israel as the Lord wipes out the Antichrist at the second coming. So that, that's the vision that he's seeing and the revelation that's given with that vision. Now when he says that, I think it's verse 8 that says, And I heard, but I understood not. And uh, that's why I was talking about before. Chapter 10, he sees the vision, he had understanding. Then he says, And I seen, but I understood not. Now it could be, if you just take it in context, that he's not understanding the last part. When, how these things are going to end, or what shall be the end of these things. In fact, his question is actually going to ask a question that's going to go beyond these things. Okay, it ends. Now what? So I'm not sure if, if, he's, if he's talking about the last part, the three and a half years, or what's going to take place after that. Or is it possible that when he says that he understood the vision, 
And I, that's what I was telling you. I understand the vision. I read it. I just explained it to you. But do you understand the meaning of the vision? How about, do you understand everything you've been taught in the book of Daniel? <laughs> you might understand what I said. <laughs> you might have a, a, a little bit of understanding, but you don't have a complete understanding. Don't forget the book is sealed. So when I, when I think of, there's, there's a couple ways to look at that. He says, I understand, but I don't understand. And I go, oh, I understand that. Because <laughs> that's true of me. That's true of any time you study Bible prophecy, you get a glimpse of it, but you don't get the full picture of it. And especially at the time of the end, when knowledge shall increase, you realize if you're living through the tribulation, you're going to say, oh, that's that. Oh, that's that. <laughs> oh, that's how that's going to work out. <laughs> There'll be more of an understanding later than Daniel could possibly have in his day or in us in the day of grace that we're living in. We, don't, we can study about the end time, but we're not going to totally understand those things. So when I look at Daniel with that, I don't have too much of a problem. You know, somebody might say, oh, that's a contradiction. I don't think it's a contradiction at all. It just expresses... Uh, how I look at things when I study Bible prophecy. Uh, but uh, we, we talked about those angels on each side of the river, the Lord in the middle of that river. But we also know, go back to chapter 10, I probably skipped that verse. No, I, I did read it. Verse 4. In the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittical. So we know what river we're talking about. But where's the river Hittical? Well, and what's the significance of that river? Um, I, I do have some maps, and I don't know that I, I quickly put two other maps. But let's first go to Genesis, all the way back to chapter 2. Now what Daniel is seeing is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back in power and great glory to establish his kingdom. That's part of what, what shall be the end of these things, uh, is that kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to set up. But we see him at that river. And if you come back to Genesis chapter 2, it says in verse 8, it says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he formed, and out of the ground made he made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight in, uh, 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 the, and, and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the river and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. From thence it was parted and became four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is, that, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bedillium and Onyx stone. The name of the second is Gihon, the same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittical. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth, is, uh, the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, first of all, notice that when the Lord, when we start out in verse 8, the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. When we talk about the Garden of Eden, there's a territory that was called Eden. And it's the eastern part of that territory where God put the Garden of Eden. So that, that Eden's bigger than the garden. But there is a garden that God planted and put man in that garden that's eastward in Eden. And we're given some clues. That at least gives you some idea. But if you have a Bible map, hopefully you already know, you know how things are laid out. You can see Babylon, so you realize you're out in the east the Mediterranean's way west of that, and that's where Jerusalem and all of that is. But when God planted the Garden of Eden, it was, he planted the garden eastward in Eden. Uh, a lot of times that area is called the, uh, the cradle of civilization. Interestingly, when you, when you study that area, uh, you, you might, if the Garden of Eden was over there, and that's the point, 
is we think that's where the Garden of Eden was. But it's also the place when God called out Abraham, he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. That's out of there. When the Gentiles, prior to Abraham, when uh, actually after the flood, when Noah and his family came down and men began to, rather than multiply and fill the earth, they, they all went to the land of Shinar, which is over by Babylon. And that's where the Tower of Babel is. Uh, so that everything started out in that area, and then God moved Abraham over toward the land of Canaan and gave him that land as an everlasting possession, and Jerusalem going to be the, the, the city of the great king. That's where Jesus Christ is going to establish his throne on the earth. But it all starts over here, and this we see the Lord Jesus Christ at the end standing in the river Hittical. Now, just to kind of get an idea of where these rivers are, look at verse 10. It says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden from, from thence, and it parted and became into four heads. Now, I don't know if I'm saying this right. I've, I've said it for a long time because, you know, when the flood came in the days of Noah, now don't forget, Moses is writing this. He's well after the flood. When the flood came, it changed the geography of the earth. There was no Mount Everest before there was a flood. When God, when God covered the earth, the highest point on the earth, by 21 feet with the water, and then when God abated the waters, what he did is he made great valleys so that the water would flow down into the valleys, and to do that, he raised mountains. So the whole geography of the world changed. When I look at that, and Moses is going to describe to me where the Garden of Eden was before the flood, how can he do that? Well, inspiration. But he says, from thence was it parted and became into four heads. Became. It didn't say went into four heads. It became into four heads. So I, I think what he's describing is something that maybe we could look at a map in Moses' day and realize approximately the area of the Garden of Eden. And there's four, there's four um, uh, rivers that came to a head in the garden, uh, came to a head as the water flowed out of the Garden of Eden. So the first one it says is Pison and encompasses the whole land of Havilah. Do you, you, they got a good map there. Do you see the Persian Gulf? Everything happens in the Persian Gulf these days as they, you know, quake and all that takes place. But Havilah seems to go like the Persian Gulf, I wonder, was it a river at one time? <laughs> because that, that Persian Gulf that covers the land of Havilah, uh, that, that seems to be an idea of where the river is. Now there, this map shows a river, and there's another man who has a map that's quite interesting, where he has a river like that, but he calls it Gion. That's another one that's coming up. But anyhow, so you, you got that Persian Gulf area. And then verse uh, uh, 13, the name of the second river is Gion, but then it says, the same is, uh, is that which compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Well, there's two places, and in this map, the, the other map I had would have showed it, that Ethiopia is over where you leave Egypt, south of Egypt is Ethiopia, and the land that covers that, there's two places. There's a river, the river Egypt, that runs straight down, but right not too far from Egypt is the Red Sea. And it covers, you know, that part goes down and covers around Africa. So that it looks like that Gion is, and if it encompasses Ethiopia, is way over in the west. How that worked over into this Middle East, that messes me up. But that's why some people say these, some of these rivers that you see out there is actually Gion and not around Ethiopia. But this says it went around Ethiopia. But notice verse 14. The name of the third river is Hittical. Now, Hittical is the old name for the Tigris River. Now, that one they just know from history. Hittical is the Tigris River. You can see where the Tigris River is on the map. And we do know, every time we trace it, the Tigris River runs down, see where Ur of the Chaldees is, <laughs> and, then, and then at the same point it, it is where the uh, uh, Euphrates River picks up. So right down there by Ur of the Chaldees is where the Persian Gulf comes in, where the Tigris River comes in, where, Ethiopia, where the uh, uh, Euphrates comes in. 
and, and so if Hittical is, is the uh, Tigris River, and then it says, for, uh, uh, and the fourth is, is uh, Euphrates. Well, there's no need to explain Euphrates. Everyone knew about the Euphrates River. So right down there where that Ur of the Chaldees, that looks like the area where the Garden of Eden used to be, where God first put man, and then man sinned, and, and then God moved it from there. Now, the reason I say all that is, first of all, we know that Babylon represents not only the rejection of the Gentiles, but it's really going to be the final place where the Antichrist, there's a, there's a prophecy about him moving his, his throne over to Babylon. Now, he's actually going to be held up in Jerusalem because he wants that. But that area of Babylon, that's, God's going to, that's where the judgment is going to take place. And, and, and so the Lord Jesus Christ is seen on that river bringing everything to an end. He's going to judge Babylon. That's Revelation 13, uh, 17, Revelation chapter 18. But there's another reason why I think he'd be by that river. Come over with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. You're still in Daniel. That's the book before Daniel. And this is an interesting chapter. Because this is the chapter where God promises, even though Israel has rebelled, he's going to restore them. And if you ever want to know what the new covenant is, we're not a new covenant church here. The new covenant is made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. They could never keep God's laws under Moses. So God is going to put his spirit within them and cause them to keep his laws, and then they're finally going to be blessed. So you have, uh, start in verse 24 of Ezekiel 36. It says, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from your filthiness of, your, of all your idols, will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. So he's going to take the hard-heartedness out of Israel and give them a soft heart toward the things of God. You know, that phrase means I'm going to take the old nature out of you, and he already said I'm going to put my spirit within you. That heart of flesh is going to be the Holy Spirit working now in the believers without a, without a, a, a rebellious old nature. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and to keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave unto your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will save you from all your uncleanness, and so forth. So God promises that he's going to establish this new covenant with the nation of Israel. These are probably things that, you know, Daniel, what, what's going to happen after this? Well, these are some of the things that are going to happen at, at the Lord returns with the believing remnant of Israel. Look at verse uh, 33. Thus saith the Lord, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and in the waste shall be builded. And the, de and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land... Was a des uh, that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste uh, and desolate ruined cities are become fenced and inhabited. Then the heathen that are round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. That's important because Israel thinks they're doing it today, and they're really accomplishing a lot and, and growing things in that desert land. But this is after the tribulation, it's going to be all desolate, and the Lord's going to do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for, your, uh, for this be inquired by, uh, of, by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them like men of a flock, as a holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in the solemn feast. So shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. 
Now, I read most of that just so that you would see that when the Lord comes back, he's going to restore the land as it says it was going to be like the Garden of Eden, verse 35. And they shall say, the land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. So when we see Jesus Christ in the river Hittical, now that's not over in Jerusalem, but he is going to restore the land that's been desolated by the tribulation and make it like the Garden of Eden. So when you keep seeing him in that river, and, and then what shall the end of these things be? Part of the end of these things is that not only does he come back and save the nation of Israel, he restores that land to like it was in the beginning of creation, as the Garden of Eden. Now there's one more thing I want to show, show you. Come back to Genesis um, chapter 15. This is where God is telling Abraham he's going to multiply his seed. He's going over the covenant that he's made with Abraham. Uh, verse 18 of Genesis 15. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Now notice the territory. From the river of Egypt unto the great river but this time the great river is called Euphrates. And then it names the people that occupy that land. They're going to take over that land. Sometime when we think the land of Canaan, we only think that little strip of Jerusalem that's, you know, just, I don't know, 70 miles wide, 100 and something miles high, about 130 something miles long, that we think that's the land God promised Abraham. It's not. God promised Abraham, when you say the, the, the river of Egypt, that's why I was telling you earlier, the river of Egypt is even west of the, of the Red Sea. And from that land, at, right, it, it, in part of Egypt, stretching all the way across to the Euphrates River, all the way over to Babylon, that's the land that God promised to Abraham that's going to be his as an everlasting possession. And that's why we're looking at him, at the Lord in the river Hittical, and there in that river Hittical, he is... It's a picture of him restoring that to the nation of Israel, and not just restoring it. Hittical is where the Garden of Eden was, and he's going to replace that land is going to become like the Garden of Eden, all the way from Egypt all the way to Babylon. It's going to be the land that was promised to Abraham. And uh, sometimes we don't think of the land being that big, that far, but that's what God promised to Abraham, and that's what he's going to restore to them. And I believe that's what we're seeing there with Daniel in that river. Now I'll just read Daniel chapter 8, or chapter 12, verse 8, but we'll study it next time. I'll be here next Sunday. I lost Daniel. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 8, after all that that Daniel sees. It says in verse 8, I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Now, he asked one last question, and the Lord is going to give him one last answer to that last question that, he's at, that he asked. But at the same time, he's telling him, Daniel, that's enough. <laughs> it's over. You've got enough vision. You've got enough revelation. He's going to answer some things about the end, some things that we're just talking about. What's going to happen after Jesus Christ comes back after the tribulation, sets up his kingdom, there's resurrection of the just, and he sets up that kingdom. What's going to happen after that? And there's, there's one more revelation that, that's going to be given to Daniel, and, uh, and I would be like Daniel. Lord, uh, one more question. One more question. <laughs> and the Lord said, this was it, Daniel. <laughs> and uh, the least he let him ask that one last question. And we'll pick up with that, that answer, which is actually going to bring us to the conclusion of the, of the book of Daniel. So uh, we'll stop there for today. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for the book. And... We thank you that we can understand and yet not fully understand. 
realizing that there's still the time of the end to come, and when that comes, knowledge will certainly increase concerning these events and these things. But we thank you that we can know what the end of these things will be, as Daniel has given that revelation, and we can compare scriptures and see what's ahead after the world is judged and Jesus Christ comes back to reign. So thank you for our study. Pray for the hour to follow that we might continue to grow in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.